Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to show you the 12 lead EKG that broke the internet. Okay, that might be a little hyperbolic. Uh, a little bit of an exaggeration. It might not have broken the internet, but this EKG I posted, I posted it on the Paramedicine 101 Facebook page and then shared it to a few different EKG groups. And it kind of stirred up some, I wouldn't say controversy, but some different opinions about the EKG, some different interpretations, so on and so forth. So uh, what the, the small amount of information I gave was that it was from a 62-year-old male with weakness. Now I know you're going to have a lot more information than that to work with. Uh, you're going to have your patient presentation, you're going to have your assessment findings, your vital signs, the patient's history, all of that comes into play, all right? And I completely agree with the critics out there that said that they wouldn't, you know, uh, make any decisions based on the 12 EDKG alone. I agree, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, you're going to want to consider the company it keeps, like Tom Boothley always says, uh, assess your patient. And, you know, correlate your assessment findings of your patient with the 12 EDKG. Um, and that really helps you complete the picture. There are instances, though, where you look at a 12 EDKG or an EKG and you can identify some some ominous things just based on the EKG alone. You know, when we go to EMT school and paramedic school, you're taught treat the patient, not the monitor. And I agree with the sentiment completely. However, you know, when you have a cardiac arrest patient, you're really treating the patient, but the monitor is determining what those treatments are. If you go down your AHA cardiac arrest algorithm, it's all rhythm dependent, right? Is it a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm? Um, so there are things or instances rather where the, the, the EKG is going to be pretty important. Here's that 12 lead, all right? Here's, uh, and there's two different 12 leads, both from the same patient. Obviously, the 12 leads are pretty similar. Now, this is a pucker factor EKG, right? You print this out, somebody hands this to you, uh, and you've got the patient that this 12 lead just came from, you're puckering up a little bit uh, because it doesn't look good, right? You don't know exactly what you're looking at right off the bat. Most people aren't, uh, you know, knowing what they're looking at right off the bat when they look at this, and that's normal, all right? You have to get down into it and, and start dissecting a little bit. So I posted this with that limited information, and some of the comments that I got, uh, you know, had to do with artifact. You know, uh, this is a very poor quality 12 lead. Do it with the truck not driving down the road. Uh, tombstones, that's where the patient's heading. Uh, someone needs to get off that bumpy dirt road. So, so uh, the question I posed was, you know, based on this 12 lead, what concerns do you have? And the reason I gave such a limited amount of information was I really wanted everybody to dissect the 12 lead EKG alone and not have... Uh, too much information helping you lead into the the right answer. So uh, that's you know kind of where my mind was at when I put it out there. But I got all these different responses uh, to so torsade to points. Uh, you know could never present an EKG like that total OCD because uh, you know of the artifact. Uh, I'd be thinking uh, uh, oh fragile rock. I don't understand this comment, but this sounds like somebody that's pretty concerned about the twelve lead. Um, and yeah, so artifact, uh, critical patients, torsades, all these things are thrown out there. VTAC was thrown out there. There was, you know, hundreds of comments. I'm not going to post them all. These were just some of the ones I picked apart. All right. So let's look at it again. And yeah, you get that pucker factor picture. You have this patient. So when I first look at this 12 lead, if, if, if somebody hands me this 12 lead, I'm going to look at my patient again. Is the only complaint really weakness because this 12 lead looks pretty serious. Um, and I'm looking to see the patient's skin color, condition, and temperature. They, I'm going to assume that they're going to be a little pale, maybe some, you know, have moistened skin, uh, because they're probably hypoperfusing with an EKG like this, right? How are they mentating? If they're complaining of weakness, are they compass menace? Are they completely alert and oriented? Uh, so I'm going to want to question the patient and see if you know they're comp mentating normally or if they're altered. I wouldn't be surprised with an EKG like this if they were altered, right? All right, so let's, um, the next thing I'm going to ask is, does this patient have a pacemaker? Because I'm seeing the same pacer spike that so many of you uh, that saw this EKG saw, and it does look appropriate, right? It looks like a, you know, a, a long pause, so the patient became bradycardic, and then a demand pacemaker, 
uh, put out a single, you know, paced beat. Looks like a ventricular pacer. Um, if this is good capture here, and then uh, you know, there's a subsequent beat, and then all this stuff that happens, that we'll talk about in a minute. And then same thing here. It looks like a long pause, pacer spike, long pause, pacer spike. So it would make sense that this would be a demand pacemaker. So I'll ask the patient or the patient's family. I'll even examine their chest for a pacer pouch. You can obviously um, identify them on, on most people. Um, either the left or the or the right chest. Look on both sides. And uh, then I'm going to you know have a, the, the next question. Is this just a standalone pacemaker or is this an AICD, right? Is this an automated implantable uh, cardiac defibrillator? Because if it is, it, it's probably malfunctioning. Um, and, and I'm assuming that it's not because there's no shock here uh, when this dysrhythmia, and this is a dysrhythmia, this is not artifact, okay? And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so I'm thinking this is an older pacemaker because of the size of this spike. Newer pacemakers, you can't even discern the spike uh, on your own. The monitor will actually superimpose it there for you. Uh, so this is a very large spike for a, a modern day pacemaker. It's probably pretty old. Uh, and it's just an implantable pacemaker, which I don't even think they do that anymore. You know, they're all kind of combination devices, typically. Um, and I don't want to speak out of turn. They might still do that in some places. But typically, you're going to get an AICD put in. All right, so uh, I see that. So pacemaker, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this is a pacer spike, uh, and it's all those things that I just said are true. Next, we got to just really start picking this EKG apart and, and, and figure out what's going on now. I do want to say in the, in the presence of this patient, if it's a critical patient, if they're unstable, you know, you're going to treat them. You're not going to sit here and dissect the EKG, and we all kind of get that, right? This A lot of this happens post-patient care, um, but there are some things that, Hopefully, after I talk about this EKG, they will pop out at you, and you'll have a better better understanding of what you're looking at. So, looking at this initial uh, dysrhythmia here, uh, where this goes into it, you can't tell what the impetus of this was uh, because you kind of caught caught it on the back end. And if you were looking at your monitor, uh, you might be able to, or if you have like a, the Zol X, where you can hit that uh, snapshot button, that actually gives you the previous few seconds that, than what you're looking at, in addition to what you're looking at, and then uh, a few seconds more, so it's a nice uh, option that you have with that. However, if, you, if you're not using that monitor um, and you just had this 12 lead, you didn't really see when this happened, you can assume that this looks like a, you know, a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia right here. In this lead uh, alone, it looks like a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Same thing in lead two. It does have the appearance of a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. However, I'm going to tell you it's probably not. Okay, I don't know that it's not. I can't prove that it's not, but it's probably not. And one of the reasons is it, it self subsides. So, it, you know, it, it, it limits, it's a paroxysmal, it goes away. All right, and then comes back over here. Um, and this looks a little bit more polymorphic. We use that word polymorphic to say that it has different shapes, right? And when, whenever we talk about a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia uh, or a wide complex tachycardia, getting down to the polymorphic version of a wide complex tachycardia, we really have two categories. You have a prolonged QT of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is torsades. That's what causes torsades, a prolonged QT. So torsade de points or torsade de point, if you're French, I guess. I don't know. I don't speak French. And then uh, uh, torsades de points is also uh, what it's called. And that is a turning of the points. That's what it stands for. And what that means is you, the, with each beat, there's a change in the, the ventricular axis. All right. It's just like a, a reentry ventricular tachycardia. However, in this case, the axis changes with each beat. And there's specific reasons why we would want to know if it's polymorphic VTAC versus, uh, or, or, or torsades versus a, a normal QT polymorphic VTAC, which is completely different, right? They're both. Of ventricular tachycardia is a change shapes. All right, that's the word polymorphic VTAC. I mean, that's kind of wh wh where that comes from. Now, you have to see this in a single lead. It's changing within a single lead. Obviously, from here, okay, look at where my mouse is pointing to here, from V5, uh, V3 to V6, that's a different lead. So, of course, the shape is going to change. Uh, but then even when it gets to V6, you could see that it changes shape a little bit within that single lead. And then again, it's transient. It goes away. All right, same thing down in here. This is a very similar, okay, in, in appearance down here uh, to the one on top. So kind of the same thing right here. Um, so 
those are your options, right? You have a polymorph of ventricular tachycardia. This could be torsades, or it could be a, a, a normal QT. And if, if you don't want me to give you the answer yet, if you want to take a few seconds to look at this further and try to figure it out on your own, go ahead and uh, pause the video because I'm going to give you the, the uh, solution to this here. It's torsades, all right? Torsades to point, or I've seen it torsade to point without the S. Uh, it's turning of the points, right? That bow tie configuration. It's hard to discern on a 12 lead, the bow tie configuration. It, it, it's much easier on a long lead. It's also hard to catch it because it's typically a transient rhythm. It comes and it goes almost always, right? It, it, it's paroxysmal in, in its nature. And what causes it? So we're going to talk about uh, torsades a little bit deeper and, and why it's important to be able to discern torsades versus that uh, a, a normal QT or non-prolonged QT uh, polymorphic VTAC, which is completely different. All right, so one thing you got to remember from when you learn EKGs is your refractory period, right? So your absolute refractory period is when another beat can't occur. It can't change anything. You know, if you have a PVC during the, the absolute refractory period, well, all of your, uh, you know, myocytes, you don't have enough repolarized or, or able to take on a new rhythm. So it's not going to, that ectopic focus isn't going to do anything. But once you have enough cells repolarized, um, there's this very dangerous, I shouldn't say dangerous, but susceptible period uh, called the relative refractory period, okay? And I've heard it explained differently on the downsloping of the T wave. Uh, here you can see this image kind of catches it on the peak and then into the downslope of the T wave. Just know that an, an ectopic beat on the T wave, right, uh, isn't a good thing. And what makes someone more susceptible for what we call R on T phenomenon, where an ectopic beat hits that T wave, is a prolonged QT interval. And that's what we're talking about here. A prolonged QT interval is this duration from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. From the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave is the QT interval. And when that is prolonged, you get a prolonged uh, relative refractory period where an ectopic focus could then occur, you know, like a premature beat and cause a lethal dysrhythmia, such as V-fib is an option, you know. Um, but a, a lot of times it's torsades. And, you know, the way it torsades often presents is syncope or seizure-like activity. So this whole uh, argument about the, uh, the artifact is kind of moot because if this was uh, torsades, they could be having, I know that I, I said the patient's complaining of weakness and you ha you'd have no reason to suspect that they were seizing, but they could be having seizure-like activity. And I'm putting up air quotes because it's not a true seizure. It's probably a anoxic posturing like you see with V-fib. So just kind of a side note, if you ever get a call for a seizure on your way to that call, you should suspect or have a high suspicion uh, for a possible cardiac arrest call because a lot of them come in that way, right? Because somebody goes into V-fib, they have anoxic posturing, somebody thinks they're seizing, so they call 911, you get there, and the patient's pulled with that. So this R on T, so here I want you to look where I'm pointing this mouth, mouse, okay? So here's a normal beat, right? Uh, and what you have here is a very long QT interval, a very long QT interval, and then an ectopic beat occurs prematurely uh, on that T wave, initiating this torsades like rhythm um and and again it's difficult it, this isn't i wouldn't say super convincing uh, to be torsades but it's polymorphic and you have a prolonged qt so that's what leads you to say that it's torsades not the bow tie pattern um yes if you had a nice uh, long lead two ekg printout your monitoring lead and you could see that bow tie pattern that's nice to have i guess but what you really must have is a prolonged qt interval and typically you would only know that before or after the rhythm is, is present. So before it occurs, if you have a nice sinus rhythm or whatever their underlying rhythm is, and you have that QT interval that you can identify, or after it subsides, because if it's torsades, it's likely going to subside for you. Um, either it'll go away and the, the underlying rhythm will uh, take back over, or they'll uh, you know degrade into an even worse dysrhythmia, which isn't exactly fun to deal with either. Let's talk about that QT interval a little bit longer. Uh, so the QT, again, it's from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And there are some th things that can affect this. Hypokalemia is one of those things. Hypokalemia causes 
a uh, depressed T wave or, or low voltage T wave. You know, remember hyperkalemia causes peak T waves, so hypo causes smaller T waves. And the problem with that is your U wave can actually become more prominent. And then if the U wave is taller than the T wave or kind of takes over the end of this T wave, that's the new QT interval you would measure from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the U wave, um, which makes it a very long QT interval. And the true QT interval that we're talking about or that we're concerned of is what we call the QTC. The C stands for corrected, and they use something called Bazet's formula. So go ahead and commit this formula to memory. Just kidding. Uh, if you don't like math, don't worry. Modern day 12 leads print this out for you. So they'll actually do the formula for you because the reason they're doing this formula, the QTC equals the QT, so your true QT interval, uh, over your R to R, uh, or the square root of your R to R interval. So the reason it's doing this is because your normal QT interval, what, what we would expect of a QT interval, changes depending on the patient's heart rate, right? So the 12 lead monitor will actually do this for you, um, and it typically prints it out like this, QT, and then you'll have the backslash, QTC, and then it gives you your QT interval, 620, backslash, and then your QTC interval of 644 milliseconds. This diagnostic reading is, is seen on most 12 EDKGs. This one specifically is from EMS12V.com, uh, which is Tom Boothelay's website. And this is a very long QTC interval, 644 milliseconds. That's kind of why I snagged it, because it stood out. The number I want you to remember, all right? Write this down. The number I want you to remember, super easy, 500. If the QTC is greater than 500, the patient is pretty susceptible for uh, dysrhythmia. If it's less than 500, much less likely. Uh, some What causes a prolonged QTC? Well, we talked about hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, of course, can also cause it. But also there's con uh, congenital causes. It's one of the leading causes of sudden unexplained death. All right. So uh, uh, the, the congenital causes, you know, like Brigada syndrome, tachycardia cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and then long QT syndrome should be in there. It's suspected to maybe be a cause of SIDS as well. All right. Um, and then you have a medication induced prolonged QT which is uh, probably the most common cause because there's so many medications that prolong the QT interval. And I want you to remember that one of them is amiodarone. Amiodarone is a sodium channel blocker. It prolongs the QT interval, uh, and that's not good, right? Because if you give a medication that prolongs the QT interval to somebody that has a dysrhythmia due to a prolonged QT interval, you're not doing them any favors. All right, another medica uh, an your antipsychotics like Haldol, uh, tricyclic antidepressants can prolong the QT interval. There's a ton of them. It's probably one of the most common causes for the black box warning uh, on a medication. Here's what I was talking about with that prominent U wave. Okay, you're not seeing the, the T wave become depressed here, but you're seeing the U wave uh, becomes a little bit larger as we look to our right here. And that's where you measure. If, if it takes over the back half of that T wave, go ahead and measure your QT interval from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the U wave. And that's going to be your new QT interval. All right, and that can happen with, uh, you know, a, a, quite a few different uh, electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, things that pretend to be torsades. These are your, your fake news uh, arrhythmias that aren't torsades. Severe hyperkalemia with a sine wave pattern. If you have a graphing calculator and you hit S-I-N or sine, enter, that's a sine wave, right? It looks like a lot like a pleth from a pleth wave from a pulse oximetry, okay? Um, that could be an indication of severe hyperkalemia. Uh, coarse V-fib. Whenever somebody first goes into ventricular fibrillation, new onset V-fib, there's a couple mimickers of torsades. One of them is that seizure-like activity, which is truly anoxic posturing. The other is the way that the rhythm looks. Coarse V-fib is often misdiagnosed as torsades. All right. So uh, fortunately, the treatment is similar. If you witness it happen, um, shock the patient. Uh, so check for a pulse, shock the patient, do what you got to do, start CPR. AFib with WPW, this is another one you should know. I've done videos on this. AFib with WPW causes a fast, broad, irregular dysrhythmia. Very dangerous, very, very fast, too. Uh, they go into rates greater than 300. The treatment for that patient is to shock them. Uh, don't even worry about medications. That patient can't stay in that rhythm uh, uh, for a, a very long pre period of time, so go ahead and shock them. Polymorphic VTAC with a normal Q QT interval. This is what we talked about. This is usually caused by somebody that's starting to experience an MI, right? Myocardial ischemia. Um, they'll go into this polymorphic VTAC. It could be caused by uh, congenital issues, uh, Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, go ahead and Google that to get a little bit more information. Takatsubo stands for octopus trap. That's the shape. You know, the, it, and, and the reason it has that name is because it was originally identified in Japan, I believe. 
Um, so it takes this octop- octopus shap- a trap <laughs> shape, excuse me, um, and uh, it's you know a cardiomyopathy. Uh, you could also have a catecholaminergic ventricular tachycardia as well. Moving back to the 12 lead. All right, so we have this torsades pattern. Again, we want to talk about treatment. So if they're unstable, if this patient's unstable, you're going to refer to your ACLS algorithm. When somebody's unstable, you shock them, right? All right. Uh, and again, it's tachycardic. It's a type of polymorphic VTAC, so you would shock them. I'm kind of on the fence about shocking torsades. Here's one of the reasons. If it, they go in and out of it, what's the point of shocking it? They're going to come out of it. Uh, so likely they need medication to, to stay out of it. Um, however, if they're unstable and they're staying in a polymorphic VTAC, yeah, shock them. It's probably not torsades, though, at that point. So it would be defibrillation. And then um, you're going to give them a medication. Now, when you're deciding if this is a, a normal QT versus a prolonged QT, I am a big believer in empiric magnesium sulfate because that mag sulfate isn't going to hurt the normal QT polymorphic VTAC. However, amiodarone, as we know it, would and could hurt the torsades patient. So let's uh, consider empiric mag no matter what you think it is. So you got a patient here. This is from MCRIT. This is pretty good information here. If you got a patient with polymorphic VTAC, you're going to then identify whether the arrhythmia terminates. If it terminates, uh, then identify the QT interval. Is it prolonged? If it's prolonged, it's torsades. That easy. Prolonged QT interval on their normal EKG makes it torsades. If not, you're thinking more along the lines of a polymorphic VTAC and consider that they might have some sort of myocardial ischemia. And again, even if you determine that it's a normal QT polymorphic VTAC, empiric magnesium sulfate isn't a bad idea. All right, magnesium sulfate, I'm not going to go too much into the doses. Usually you see a dose like 1 to 2 grams over 10 to 15 minutes, um, but you're going to want to obviously reference your guidelines and what your medical director wants you to do. Stay away from the amiodarone for uh, torsades. It prolongs the QT interval, and it's not a great treatment. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this video. Hopefully I provided you with some new information or you know a good EKG uh, to, to really learn a lot of information from. And uh, that's pretty much it for now. I will see you in the next video.